All right, you can turn in your Bible this morning to Luke chapter 16. This is going to be our first uh, non-electric sermon. <laughs> uh, the had a really strange storm here today. is October 30th, 2011, and all the leaves are on the trees yet, or most of the leaves are on the trees yet, and we had a couple inches of snow, like about six inches probably. Heavy you know, snow. Very heavy wet snow, and we had a lot of limbs coming down, so we're without electric. Probably won't be getting it back for another 24 hours at least yet. So we're going to be recording this on battery power. Kind of a unique thing. Kind of gives us an appreciation for uh, the preaching in the past. Of course, they didn't have voice recorders either back then, but recording in MP3 format. But uh, we're going to talk today about more common Scripture misconceptions. Things that people believe that actually when you study it in the Bible, when you look it up, it's not so. Okay, now, the first part of this one, the more scripture or common scripture misconceptions part one that I did, I ended it with one of the scripture misconceptions, but I didn't really give the scripture for it. So I'm going to do that today. And that is, did you ever hear the thing somebody says, that's a lie straight out of hell? That's a you know, very popular thing. And, and it's something that you hear it and you go, oh yeah, that sounds good. And you repeat it. But it, is it based on scripture? And the answer to that is no. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. We're going to actually see an account here of a man that was in hell. It says here, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Now let me just stop there for just a second. This is the only place in the entire Bible that uses that term, Abraham's bosom. Okay, this is a very interesting thing. It's been covered in other studies, so I'm not going to get into it in great detail here. But in the Old Testament, they had the blood of animals that, were, that was covering their sins, but their sins weren't paid for until the cross. So they couldn't get into heaven. So they would go down there to the heart of the earth. There was a separate place, which we're going to read about here. There was a separate chamber where the, the lost would go to hell, and they'd be over there. And then the, the saved Old Testament Jews would be in Abraham's bosom, in this underground you know, cave, or I'm not sure exactly what it was. It's an interesting thing. Now that's not down there anymore. You don't go down there and then go to heaven. Okay, You go straight to heaven. Uh, Paul said about absent from the body, present with the Lord. All right. Now, verse 23. The rich man there died and was buried. Verse 23. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. He was not in the grave. Okay? You're not tormented by flames in the grave. Alright? He was in hell. Hell is a place of literal fire, literal burning. Okay? That's what you see there. Uh, verse 25. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence, hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Verse 27, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. Now hold on a second. If lies come from hell, why didn't he say, I don't believe in fire. I don't believe hell's a place of literal burning. I don't believe that, you, that you're lying to me. No. Anything at all that this rich man says in this entire chapter is truth. You see, right now there's an awful lot of people that do not believe in hell. The average man or woman, if you go out there and you say, do you believe in hell? They'll say, oh, no, I don't believe such a place could exist. And yet if you would swear at them and say, why don't you go to hell? They get offended. Well, if hell's not a real place, why do you get offended? See? But see... 
when somebody goes, when they live their life in sin and they reject Jesus Christ and they die and they go to hell, there's no more lies there. Everything becomes apparent. Everything becomes true. They're, they're, they're not to see. They're not down there going, I wonder where I'm at. You know, I wonder what this place is here. Uh, you know, this can't be hell because I don't believe in hell. No, they know at that point in time. Okay? So you see, truth is coming. Truth comes from hell. Truth is something that people realize when they're down there. All right, uh, verse 28. And notice there in verse 27, he said about, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. In other words, if Lazarus can't come here and help me, send him to my father's house. Verse 28. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Now that's very telling right there. You know what the prayer is of somebody in hell? They're praying that their family members don't come there. Why is that? Because they realize that the Bible's true. And they realize, they don't say, well, you know, I think I might get out of here. You know, this probably is just purgatory. No. Once they're there, they understand that they're there and they understand it's for eternity. And their greatest prayer, their greatest desire is that somebody could tell their lost relatives that are still alive on the earth, somebody tell them and get them out of this place. It's a serious thing. Finishing up here, verse 29 through 31. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will believe and receive. No, it says they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Okay? The word of God is all you need. And if somebody doesn't believe this book, well, then they're going to end up in hell. Just as simple. You know, it's just, that's the way it is. But you see there, truth, this guy hasn't said one thing that's wrong. He hasn't lied one time. He hasn't exaggerated. He hasn't said anything wrong. So the one account of a man that's in hell, it's truth. Now, the perception there is when somebody says that's a lie from hell, they are saying that because they think of this Hollywood mentality that God's in heaven, Satan's down in hell. And Satan's got some office down there and he sends the devils out to do his bidding. That's nonsense. That's not what the Bible teaches. You can listen to our sermon, Satan doesn't run hell, God does, if you want more information on that. The devil's not been in hell yet, okay? He doesn't want to go there, all right? So that's, I know it's a tempting thing to say. You want to associate hell with Satan and you say, well, that's a lie from hell. No, but see, the Lord's not going to really bless those kinds of statements. They're contrary to Scripture. If you want to make a statement, somebody says something, you can say, you know what, that's a lie from Satan. See, Satan is the father of lies. That's accurate. You can say that, but don't, you know, repeat this this thing. That's a lie straight out of hell. No, that's not true. That's a lie straight out of Satan. Yeah, that would be good to say. So there's your first common scripture misconception here. Now, what about the second one? Now, we kind of covered this, you know, Jesse covered this the one time in one of his sermons on honest soul winning. You can hear it, but I just thought I'd hit it one more time because it's very prevalent among churches today. And that is that the lost go to hell because Christians don't warn them. Did you ever hear that one? Sure. And what's the proof text? Something in the Pauline epistles? Of course not. Go back to Ezekiel. Back in your Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 3. This is one of the favorite ones of the big mouth uh, evangelist that comes and yells and screams and puts on a good performance for people. And a lot of people, you know, they, they get scared into soul winning through this passage here. But if you actually look at the passage and see who it's written to and see what's actually being said, it has nothing to do with a Christian witnessing to the lost. You know, I mean, even instruction in righteousness, it's, you know, you should witness to people. It's a good thing. But you just, you can't twist scriptures. You know, you can't go back and steal stuff out of the Old Testament. I'll steal these verses here, but then I won't take the things about the animal sacrifices and the, and the Levitical priesthood and all that other stuff. You know, 
you, you can't do that. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. All right? Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 18 through 21. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Hmm. Verse 20. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness, and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die, because thou hast not given him warning. He shall die in his sin, and his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man, and the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned, also thou hast delivered thy soul. Now, the typical thing there, like I said, is some guy will read that and he'll say, if you're not witnessing to everybody that you run into, if you're not leading at least 12 people a week, you know, or a minute to the Lord, you know, then you're got their blood on your hands, you know. How dare you call yourself a Christian if you're not winning souls, you know, 50 a week. It's ridiculous. And a lot of times these, these big mouth guys that are doing that, a lot of times you actually look at their quote-unquote soul winning methods and what they're doing is they're force feeding it to people. They're just ramming salvation to people and they will not take no for an answer. And finally the person just says, yeah, okay, what do I got to do? Pray this prayer, brother, and then you'll be saved. And they pray a prayer and they don't mean it for anything. And what's happening is they're actually creating false converts. And then they're going into their churches and they're bragging about, oh, I led 3,000 people to the Lord this last, you know, yesterday. And, you know... If if you haven't done the same thing, well, then you got a lot of blood on your hands. And you're going to answer at the judgment seat of Christ. It's ridiculous. All right, don't don't let these people pressure you into stuff. Watch out for this thing of preachers that stand up and scream at you. Okay, that's something that you need to watch out for. That is flesh. All right, when you see men lifting up their voices, it's because they're outdoors. They don't have, they're not indoors with a PA system. There's no reason for a man to be putting on a show up there. And what happens a lot of time is the guy's up there yelling and screaming and putting on a performance and it gets the flesh pumped up and you think, you know, I mean, look at a sport game, a uh, sporting event. What are the people doing? Yeah, yeah, they're yelling. Why? It's adrenaline. It's flesh. That's what it is. And so you bring it into a church building and you get some guy up there putting on a show like that, screaming and yelling. And a lot of times the people aren't even checking the scripture. They just believe what they're being told. It's very dangerous. But let's ask some questions here about this passage. First of all, who is it written to? What's the context? Okay. Jump up there to verse 15. It says here, then I came. What's, first of all, let me just ask a question. What's the name of the book? Ezekiel. Okay, prophet Ezekiel is, is who this book is written by, inspired by the Lord through Ezekiel. It says here in verse 15, Then I came to them of the captivity of Tel Aviv, and that dwelt by the river of Chebar, and I sat where they sat and remained there, astonished among them seven days. And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto Christians, came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have made thee, a watchman. You know what the word the means? See, this is the superiority of your King James Bible. Whenever you see in your King James Bible, thee, thou, thy, thine, that's a singular reference. God is not saying to everybody for the next 2,000 years or 3,000 years, whatever, you know, everybody from now on into the church age, I'm talking to everybody. Uh-uh. He's speaking here to Ezekiel. That's what's going on here. I mean, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. The house of what? Israel. The Gentiles aren't even in the picture. Rightly divide the word of truth, people. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. And I say unto the wicked, 
thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. He's speaking to Ezekiel. Now look at uh, verse 19 through 21. We're going to see if these verses line up with church age doctrine. Turn the page here a while. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he not turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Huh? Thou hast delivered thy soul? So in other words, if I don't witness to the lost, if I don't warn some wicked guy or whatever, you know, I just keep my mouth shut, I'm cowardly, then I lose my salvation? How do you line this up with church age doctrine? See, people just go charging through this stuff and they don't think about it. Uh, verse 20. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin. Now look at this. And his righteousness which he hath done shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Wait a second. A righteous man does iniquity, and the righteousness that he did in his past, God doesn't remember it? How does that line up with eternal security here in the church age? It doesn't. Right now, as a Christian, you are a member of the body of Christ. You are born into God's family through the spirit of adoption. He's your father. You're not going to be unborn again. But according to that verse, it says that you are. If this applies to us, it doesn't. This is a reference to somebody back in the Old Testament. You have to rightly divide this stuff. Okay? Um, if you want proof about the thing of uh, eternal security there, you can listen to our sermon on that. But uh, Ephesians 1.13 and 4.30 both say that you're sealed under the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit of promise. doesn't line up. You can't make these two things mesh together all right it just it doesn't work now jump down to verse 22 and again there in verse 21 you see about the thing if if you know he's warned then you've delivered your soul again you know thy soul verse 22 and and the hand of the lord was there upon me and he said unto me arise go forth into the plain and i will there talk with thee then i arose and went forth into the plain and behold the glory of the lord stood there as the glory which I saw by the river of Chebar, and I fell on my face. Then the Spirit entered into me, and he set me upon my feet, and spake with me, and said unto me, Go shut thyself within thine house. Shouldn't you be going out street preaching and witnessing? So winning? Verse 25, But thou, O son of man, behold, they shall put bands upon thee, and shall bind thee with them, and thou shalt not go out among them. Look at verse 26. And I, who is the I? The Lord. I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of, roof of thy mouth, that thou shalt be dumb, and not, shalt not be to them a reprover, for they are a rebellious house. Hmm. But when I speak with thee, I will open thy mouth, and thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, He that heareth, let him hear, and he that forbeareth, let him forbear. For they are a rebellious house. You say, well, now that's a contradiction. Well, it would be if you don't rightly divide the scripture. Go back to the book of Proverbs there. We're not going to go there right now. But it says about the thing, you have two different things there. That you're not to, sometimes you're not to uh, answer a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Other times you're supposed to answer him, lest he be wise in his own conceit. There are times that when you should talk to somebody about sin and about wickedness, and there are times when you should not. And a lot of times it's the Lord will say, you know, here's a door, an opportunity. You know, you'll, you'll see that kind of a thing. You know, you'll be working with somebody and they'll go, I just don't understand what life's about. And the Lord goes, poke, you know, <laughs> gives you the old elbow, start speaking, you know. Other times it's just like you just can't get a word in edgewise. You have to be able to discern those times, Okay. But this thing of just forcing you to speak all the time, it's not even supported by this text. 
See, they'll quote verses 18 to 21, but then they'll leave out verses 26 and 27. They'll leave that out where sometimes the Lord says, hey, I'm going to actually make you like you're dumb, you know, to Ezekiel, that you aren't even going to be able to warn these people because they're rebellious. You see, there are some people you don't, you know, we look on the outward appearance. We don't know what's going on with the heart. And there are some people that have rejected the Lord and they don't want anything to do with the Lord. And I think the Lord can see that. We can't. But I think the Lord sees it and He says, don't even bother with them. Amen. Don't even waste your time on that person. All you're going to get is a false profession of faith and they're going to be worse for it. You know, I would rather see somebody who just rejects Jesus all their life and just, yeah, I'm going to hell. I know I'm a sinner. Whatever. I'd rather see somebody like that than one of these false converts like the, like you have in these modern churches. Mm-hmm. You know, they're worse. They're a lot worse. Okay? Because what happens a lot of times with a false convert, they'll go out and make more false converts. A lost, wicked sinner, just they go out and do their own thing. They don't worry about messing people up like that. So, do not fall for this whole thing of if you have an opportunity or you meet somebody who's lost and you don't witness to them, oh, their blood's going to be on my hands now. No, no. And you're not going to have to, you know, you're not going to lose your soul as it says there in those verses. That's ridiculous. Okay, you should take opportunities to witness to people. If the Lord opens a door of opportunity, walk through it. You know, it's not easy. It takes courage to do that. But now what about some new New Testament instruction for witnessing to the lost world? Matthew chapter 13. You saw there in that text that it does not teach, if you take all the verses in Ezekiel chapter 3, it does not just teach that you have to witness to everybody all the time, no matter what, no exceptions. The Bible just doesn't teach that. Matthew chapter 13. We're going to see about the words of Jesus here, what He has to say. Alright, Matthew chapter 13, verse 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. Okay, there's your first type of person that you'll run into you have somebody who's unbelieving and skeptical okay they hear it they go i don't understand it whatever you know and they and the word that they hear the seed that was sown they just kind of you know they just forget it i don't even want to think about that yeah whatever that's the majority of people right there verse 20 and 21 is your next group but he that received the seed into stony places the same as he that heareth the word and anon with joy receiveth it Yet he yet hath he no root, not root in himself, but doeth for a while, for when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. There you have your false convert. You have these people, oh I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, you know, a couple years later they're right back to their old ways again. Living just like the lost world, hating you for telling them the truth. That's your false convert. Verse twenty two, the third type of uh hearer. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. Okay, notice it does not say that he never got saved there, that he has no root or anything. It's just he becomes unfruitful. Well, what's that? That's the apostate Christian. They're truly saved, but they're just doing absolutely nothing for the Lord. That's what you have right there. And there's a lot of people that are like that. There's a lot of people that have a good business sense about them. They have nice houses, brand new vehicles sitting out front and whatever else, and they're just doing nothing for the Lord. They're they're pew warmers in church buildings. That's all they are. They're good at singing hymns and putting money in the offering plate. And that's it. There are a lot of people like that. And by the way, I just want to say, it's very hard sometimes to differentiate between the false convert and the apostate. Sometimes it's very hard to tell. <laughs> okay, uh, it talks about back there in Titus about how in works, um, and how 
uh, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him. You know, it's very difficult to tell sometimes with these modern apostates. But now verse 23. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. So there's your truly saved convert, your Bible-believing convert. Turn to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, verse 10. Okay, it says here, And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? That will happen. <laughs> uh, but he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Do you remember the false convert? He has no root. You know, uh, verse 14, keep witnessing to them or their, or your blood, their blood will be on your hands. Is that what it says? No. It says, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Now, I've said this time and time again, and I like to drive points home and keep it into your mind. Here you have God manifest in the flesh. And he is saying that there are certain people that you let alone. Now, who more than God manifest in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ, he could have taken those people and said, believe. And they would have instantly dropped to their knees and, you're God in, in the flesh. Oh, the, he, could have, he could have revealed everything to those Pharisees. That's not how he works. Okay? You see, he has something programmed into us called a free will. Amen. That's how you get people that truly love the Lord, truly truly love. I mean, w true love is that forced? Yeah. No. It's got to be by free will. All right? It, just incredible. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You say, "Well, now Brian, those are those are in the book of Matthew and you know, Matthew is predominantly Old Testament." And it is. Anything pre-crucifixion is technically Old Testament. Read Hebrews chapter 9 if you don't believe that. Um, <clears throat> but does this carry over into the Pauline epistles? Does it carry over for you today as a Christian? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4. Okay, it says here, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? You shouldn't name yourself after the, a man. Lutheran, Mennonite, you know, Wesleyan, whatever. Yeah. Verse 5. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? Now look at this. Verse 6. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Uh, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Our responsibility, as you read back there in Matthew, first of all, we're to plant the seeds of the gospel. Okay? This book right here is the spiritual seeds. Okay? That you need to get out there. You need to distribute. You need to publish the word, as it says there in the Bible. And this if you put this word out, it won't return void. That's why it's very important to make sure that if you have gospel tracts, that they have a lot of King James Bible Scripture in them. Don't put out things with cute little sayings and stuff like that. Your own words are the words of men. Don't do that. It needs to be based on Scripture. Put those seeds out. Okay. The, the second thing that you do there is water the seeds with the Word of God. You know, somebody hears the gospel, come along and water the seed. Okay, they've heard it. Just come along and say, hey, you know, the Bible says whatever, whatever. Plant the seed first and then water the seed after that. But then guess who it is up to to save that person? God. God gives the increase. Okay? It just... 
this whole thing, this hyper soul winning thing is very, very dangerous because I think a lot of false converts are created because these guys, they have their quota, you know, and they got to get these people saved. If they don't, you know, the blood's going to be on their hands and all that. It's nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Put the seeds out there, and if you have a chance to do some watering, do some watering. Okay? Anybody can do that. Right? There are tracks. There are little gospel coins that you can get that are waterproof. You don't even have to talk to people. Just go out there and put them out in a, in a park or along a trail, a walking trail. Work your way up. Okay? Start out taking, go get some tracks, go to a public restroom someplace, put them in places, or go to a store, lay them around places. You don't even have to talk to people. And as you get more bold, as the Lord gives you opportunity, hand them to somebody. All right? If you get a chance to witness to somebody at work, witness to them. Water the seed if you've planted it before. But it's up to God to give the increase. And God won't make it some kind of a thing where you have to you know, force salvation on them. You plant the seed, you water the seed, and then it, God will say, okay, now it's time to lead this person to the Lord. They understand that they're a sinner. They know that they need to be saved. They will be anxious to be saved. Okay, it isn't some kind of a thing where you got to wrestle them to the ground and say, you will get saved, you know, because I don't want your blood on my hands. <laughs> it's ridiculous. All right, now the next... Uh, common scripture misconception, and this is one that's used a lot by the modern modern uh, rock and roll Christians. When in Rome, do as the Romans do. Did you ever hear that one? Yeah. You know? I mean, I've heard them actually say, you say, you know, Christian rock is wrong. Well, I'm just trying to reach the lost with, with what they're familiar with. You know, I mean, the Bible says, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. The Bible does not say that. That statement appears nowhere in the King James Bible. I can't say about the other versions. I don't know. <laughs> you know, the Lord only knows what's all in those things. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 18. Turn over there. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 18. It says here, this is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I uh, preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Now, could Paul abuse his power in the gospel? He was an apostle. The signs of the apostles, he had, he had wrought them before these people. He could have been a Christian celebrity, but he didn't do it. Now, Paul took money from other churches but he wouldn't take it from the church at Corinth because they would have made his glorying void. Okay, There are certain people, when you get into ministry, there are certain people you shouldn't take money from. Big denominational things or big rich people, be very careful who you take money from. You know, They can make your glorying void. They can try to control you. Paul knew that. Okay, uh, Verse 19, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Now look at here, verse 20. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them, gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. That I might gain them that are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Now I want you to notice there are four groups there. Okay, First of all, you have Jews. That's a racial distinction. Okay, To the Jews became I as a Jew. How did he do that? He was a Jew. It was his race. Number two, them that are under the law. How did he do that? Those would be your Orthodox Jews. Well, Paul used to be one of them, so he could relate to them. Okay? Was that sin? No. Okay? Uh, number three, <clears throat> them without the law. Who's that? The Gentiles. Okay, Paul could understand that too. Why? Well, because he was a Roman. 
as a citizen. What about the weak? Could Paul understand that? Yeah. Paul had sickness. Paul knew what it was like to go through sickness and to not have God heal him. Now, any of those four groups there, does it say anything at all about uh, rock and roll music or drunkards, people that smoke, people that fornicate, whatever? You know, to the fornicators became I a fornicator, that I might win the fornicators. You know, no. You don't fall into sin so that you can lead sinners out of the sin. That's ridiculous. None of those four groups that are mentioned there had anything to do with sin. Not at all. Okay? It's, it's just absurd, this teaching, that, you know, the lost world, you know, they, they like uh, rock and roll guys with long hair and, and they can play guitar really good. So I have to be that in order to save them. Well, let me ask you a question. If you have to be that in order to save them, then what are you going to be after they get saved? You're going to go back to being a Christian again? See, it's absurd. It's a, it's a foolish argument. No, what they're doing is they're ashamed of the cross of Jesus Christ. They're ashamed of the Word of God. They're ashamed of the old hymns. They're ashamed of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they compromise and they go over to the world and look like the world and act like the world so that they can fit in. And they create false converts. That's what this whole movement of the modern contemporary Christian music thing is. There's an article in the paper uh, yesterday about uh, Third Day, supposed to be the biggest Christian rock group ever. They've been around for 20 years now, you know, and they're they're the big shots now. They're great and everything. And they said that they're, they have two albums that went platinum, and those two albums were secular. <laughs> you know, oh, but we're strong in our faith. and uh, Yeah, no, they're not. And he talked about the lead singer from a, the rock group Pearl Jam, and he said, I feel like I owe him a lot because I adopt a lot of his style, you know. Not, hey, I owe the Lord Jesus Christ everything in my life. I'm just a wretched little sinner down here. No, no. I owe the secular rock singer over here that's on his way to hell. And, you know, I think this third day guy's on his way to hell too. But, you know, I owe him. I owe him my life, you know. See, it's absurd. But what are they doing it for? What What is the motivation for the contemporary Christian rock music? Well, it started out that we have to be like the lost to win the lost. Now it's just, well, this is the way it is. This is the way I choose to worship the Lord. This is the way I choose to serve God. It's wrong. Absolutely wrong. Okay, so don't fall for this thing of when in, the, when in Rome do as the Romans do. There's no scripture for that. Not at all. And by the way, I'll say this before we continue. If you get sick a lot and you have problems and you've gone through depression or you've had uh, marriage problems or job problems or, or money problems or whatever, you have to keep in mind that maybe the Lord's allowing that in your life so that you can be a help to somebody else that's going through it. The problem with a lot of Christians out there is they've never gone through any kind of rough times. So when you actually meet with a lost person who's going through some rough times, they can't relate to you, you know. But those Christians out there that have gone through some rough times that know what depression's like, and they meet up with somebody that's lost, and they say, well, "You might not understand this, but I'm really going through depression." That Christian can then come in and say, "Actually, yes, I do." <laughs> you know. So in other words, the Lord is making you. Yeah. Or, or made. You, yeah. Right. Verse, I should have. I wanted to emphasize that, and I didn't think about it. Verse twenty-two. Paul says there <clears throat> Paul says there I am made all things to all men. He does not say I make myself. God put him through things. Why? That I might by all means save some. In other words there uh notice there too he says save some. You're not going to get everybody. All right? Why? Because it's God that gives the increase. Now the fourth one. One more to do after this one. Uh but the fourth one this will be a pretty quick one. Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. I'm going to make some enemies on this one, but that's okay. That's what my life's about. <laughs> Do you ever hear the thing of animals go to heaven? And heaven is going to be what I like? You know? Some little boy or girl loses their little dog or their cat or something. They say, 
well, you know, Spot's going to be waiting for you in heaven. Uh, no, he's not. You know, animals are a nice thing. I've had dogs, you know, growing up and stuff, but I'm not going to see them in heaven. Okay, that's ridiculous. I'm sorry. You know, my dirt bike that I had when I was a kid is not going to be waiting for me in heaven, you know, tied up behind the back of the mansion or something. I mean, it's ridiculous. You say, well, how can you prove? How do you know what heaven's about? Well, I have a Bible. And my Bible says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Nothing that you have down here on this earth is going to be waiting for you when you get to heaven. That's good. You say, oh, that's, that's horrible. I can't imagine a place like... No, it's good. This down here is corruptible. Everything down here breaks down and falls apart. You know, it's not going to be up there forever. All right? And by the way, it says there, which God hath prepared. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. It's not that we get up there and we say, okay, hey, you, God, yeah, okay. You're going to have this for me. I want this to eat for supper tonight. I want this, you know... This thing of, of sunshine all the time, I need a little bit of darkness to get some good sleep. That's not going to be the way it is. You're going to get there and you're going to be falling on your face before the Lord Jesus Christ and you're going to be doing what He wants you to do. When He says, get up, you're going to get up. When He says, okay, time to come and worship, you're going to come and worship. This this thing of heaven's going to be me, you know, a bass boat on a pond with my little log cabin in the hills, that's not going to be heaven. All right. Heaven is what God wants. And I'm going to make my point here in just a little bit. Turn back to Ecclesiastes, back in your Old Testament. I'm going to show you another good scripture here. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 19. It's the book that comes between Proverbs and the Song of Solomon. Ecclesiastes 3, 19. 19 through 21 is what we're going to read. I'm going to show you another reason why you're not going to see your dog or your cat in heaven. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them. <clears throat> As the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they have all one breath so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast, for all is vanity. Okay, you aren't any better than your dog as far as living. Your dogs are going to die a lot sooner than you will, or your cat, or your goldfish, or whatever. But the point is, you're both going to die. Verse 20, All go unto one place. All are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. You're going to die, and you're going to rot and decompose just like your dog or your cat. But now here's the difference. Verse 21. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? You have an eternal spirit within you and an, end, an eternal soul. A dog does not. Okay? And you say, well, you know, I just, I don't know if I can agree with this, you know. I, I just, I think that there could be Something wrong. Okay, well then let me ask you a question. If you don't believe, you know, you think that your dog's in heaven and you're not convinced and whatever else, uh, how did your dog make it to heaven? The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. When did your dog make a profession of faith? Or your cat? Or your goldfish? <laughs> did they get in by good works? Men and women can't get in by good works. How does your dog or cat make it in? You say, well, why are you making such a big deal? This isn't a big deal. Oh, yeah, it is. Because you see, when you tell your child, even though they're grieving, I, I know it's a sad thing to lose a pet. You know, we lost pets before. It's, it's a sad thing. Dogs can be very loyal. I don't care for cats, but, you know, <laughs> people like them. Hey, you know, a pet can be a good thing. I'm not, I'm not cutting on people that have pets. Don't get offended at that. But the point is, it's never right to lie. And if your dog or your cat dies and your child is crying about it, it's not right to lie to them and say, Oh, little Jimmy, 
you know, little Fluffy's going to be in heaven waiting for you when we get there. That's not right. It's not supposed to be that way. Okay? And uh, I don't have the articles here with me, but I have two different articles from our local newspaper, both Methodist churches, where they now have these things. Methodists, for some reason, are going off on this. They have this thing now, the animal blessing services. You bring your dog or your cat or whatever animal you have in, and the preacher comes and he, you know, he put, lays his hands on them, I guess, and prays for them or something. I like to bring in a bear, see if he blesses that. But, you know, pet bear. But the point is, they're, they have these animal blessing services. Where's the scripture for that? You say, well, you know, I think it's a nice thing to do. Yeah, it's a real nice thing to do if you're trying to make money. That's what it's about. Because it's all, anybody from the community can come and will bless their animals. And then we have treats for the, for the, they say, for the pet and their people. You know, like like the people are owned by the animal or something. Pretty disgusting. And by the way, I don't have time to get into this, but partway through the tribulation, the Bible says that animals and birds and beasts and everything actually turn on people. So these people that have these dogs that they love so much and everything and cats and whatever else, in the tribulation, they're actually going to go nuts and they're going to turn on the people. And the people are going to have to kill their own pets. <laughs> what a horrible thing. <laughs> so, you know, again, it, it's just not right to lie. Okay, it's a, it's a common scripture misconception that people have that their, their pet is going to be in heaven waiting for them. It's not what the Bible teaches. Okay, don't lie to people. Now, the final one here, and then we're going to close. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Back to the New Testament. Do you ever hear the thing that uh, before you pray, you have to take your hat off? What's the scripture on that? You say you're, you know, you're a man or whatever, and you you're going to pray. You know, well, take your hat off first. Now, before we get into the study, I will say that I think it is an act of reverence. I think that in theory, it's an okay thing to do. You know, if you're if you're among believers or Sit down at a at a meal or something like that. Take your hat off, okay? As far as a custom, a tradition, fine. I don't have a problem with it. I'm not trying to blast it and say it's a heresy or something like that. Not at all. But is it backed up by Scripture? Okay, and is it, is it a sin to pray with a hat on? So we're going to look at that. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 12. I'm going to be kicking something else here. You can probably figure out what's coming. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now do we need to define what the head thing is about there? It's talking about spiritual headship. Keep that in mind. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Now, right there you see the thing people say, see, you can't wear a hat. That's not what it's saying. Continuing on here. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn, but if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For, indeed, for a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Now, what's going on here? Well, go back there to verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. Okay? Head of the woman is the man, the head of Christ is God. 
Verse 4, Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Now what's the definition of the man's head? Christ. Okay? If you pray or prophesy, and uh, having your head covered, that dishonors Jesus Christ. Well, what's the head covering there? Okay? What is it? Well, it's a pastor. Or a man that's between you and the Lord. All right, First Timothy chapter two verse five says, "For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus." A man is to have direct access to the throne room through the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody in between. How would it be if you guys? I mean, I'm the pastor here at Bible Believers Fellowship. How would it be if I required every man when he would pray, he would say, "Dear God, in the name of Jesus Christ." through Brian Denlinger, and then you pray. Would that be a dishonor? Yeah. Uh, slightly. <laughs> you know, don't do that. I don't want to be in trouble. You know, that's a bad thing. And yet, what do the Catholics do? They pray through men. Oh, but St. Joseph and St. Bartholomew and St. Ignatius, you know, de Loyola or whatever, they pray through men like that. A lot of them, they don't believe, and they'll go through their priest to confess their sins. They're dishonoring Jesus Christ. Of course, they're not saved, but the, you know most of them aren't saved. But the point is, you're not to have anybody between yourself and the Lord. A pastor's job is just simply to oversee and to teach the Bible. But you don't pray through my name to get to the Lord. That's what's going on there. And you say, well... You know, I don't know. I don't know if I can agree with that. I still think it means an, an actual physical covering there on the man's head. Okay, how do you explain First Thessalonians chapter five verse seventeen, which says, "Pray without ceasing"? Do you realize if you say that I don't believe a man should pray with something on his head, that means you can never wear something on your head. The Bible says, "Pray without ceasing." Let me ask you a question: What if you're out riding on a motorcycle and your state requires helmets? <laughs> You should wear a helmet, by the way. But you're riding along on a helmet, and all of a sudden you see somebody pulling out. You say, I can't pray. My head's uncovered, or my head's covered. You know, I'm going to wreck here. I'm going to die. I'm going to slam into this guy. I don't have time to stop. But I can't pray. I can't cry out to the Lord and say, oh, God, help me. I can't do that because my head's covered. You see the problem it gets you into? It's not what the Bible's trying to teach right there. You can pray with your head covered. Okay? physical covering but if you put a man above yourself and the lord you're going to dishonor jesus christ that's all that's being said there but what's it say here about a woman but every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head okay what's going on there her head uncovered that means she has no male authority over her like a feminist would do feminist that says i won't have a husband I'm not interested now. I'm going to pursue my career. I won't have a preacher tell me what to do, and I won't listen to my father, my earthly father. You know, what do you have there? You have a woman like that that says, "Oh, you know," and then she goes to pray to Jesus Christ, and it's like, "Hey, I'm sorry, you're uncovered." This is not talking about a physical covering. Okay, verse six: For if the woman be not covered by the spiritual authority of a man, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. Now a little bit of historical context here. In Corinth at that point in time, a woman who had a shaved head, that was a sign that she was a prostitute. Okay? So Paul's saying, hey, if you don't want to be covered in the sense of having a man spiritually covering you, just shave your head and look like a prostitute. That's what he's saying. Hey, you want to be a feminist? You don't want to have a man rule over you? Shave your head and go out and sell your body. That's what Paul's saying. You know? Verse 7, For a man ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Okay? Speaking about having, you know, a man that you go to, you know, I mean, think of how weird that is. For a man to have another man ruling over him and not willing to deal with Jesus Christ directly. That's strange. 
Okay, it's kind of effeminate in a way, you know. I can't pray to Jesus. I have to go to my priest, you know, and confess my sins to him. No, you don't. <laughs> confess to the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8, For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Look at verse 10, For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Now, the teaching that a woman has to wear a cloth veil or some kind of a thing on her head, you know, whatever, how does that give her power on her head? And by the way, let me ask a question. Why does it have to be you have the Mennonites here in the area and the Amish and you have charity ministries and they all wear different head coverings? Let me ask a question. Is one of them more powerful than the others? What's the scripture for that? I mean, the charity ministries, when we're kind of like a, looks like a napkin, it's long and kind of rectangular. The Mennonites wear kind of a small round thing on the top of their head. And the Amish kind of wear a little bit more of like a bonnet type of a thing with strings hanging down. You know, which is the most powerful? What if a woman wears a cowboy hat? You know, one for made for women, of course. What about a big hat? You know, you see some of the older pictures and stuff, uh, and uh, they have these big hats with flowers on them and stuff. Is that more powerful? What's the scripture here? See, it has nothing to do with a cloth covering up there on their head. It's talking about a covering of a man, spiritual authority on their head. That's what it's talking about. And you say, well, then a woman has to pray through her husband or pray through her pastor's name. No. A woman prays to Jesus Christ, but she has to be in submission to a man. That's the way a Christian lady is supposed to be. God does not want women in authority. It's just the way it is. Okay? A lot of feminists just simply aren't going to like that. Which, you know, again, I don't really care. <laughs> but uh, Paul goes on to clarify there in verses 11 through 13, you know, that he's not putting women down by what he's saying. Okay? Uh, he's saying there, uh, Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. All right? He's just simply saying, Hey, I'm not putting you women down. Men need women. Okay? It's fine to be married. You know, it's good to have women around. You're to honor your wife, the Bible says. Not putting women down. He's just saying... God has a proper order for things. God has a proper way that it's supposed to be. All right? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. Now we'll jump down here. Now it actually changes gears here a little bit. It's talking about spiritual authority there down to verse 12. or I'm sorry, down to verse uh, 13. Now verse 14. Or I'm, no, I'm sorry, down to verse 12, now verse 13. Judge in yourselves, is it, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered without a male authority? Verse 14, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Hmm. Now it switches to physical covering. Uh verse well we'll get to, to verse 16 here in a minute uh, revelation chapter 9 verse 7 and 8 says and the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold and their faces were as the faces of men and they had hair as the hair of women and their teeth were as the teeth of lions so you have these demonic creatures in the tribulation and it says they have long hair like a woman but they have a face of a man again you see there's supposed to be a distinction. Men are supposed to look like men. Short hair. Women are supposed to look like women. Long hair. Right? That's what's saying. It's being said there. And it's interesting. Verse 15, But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her. You know, it's kind of interesting because how many songs out there in the secular world are, are, have been written about a woman's hair? There's a lot of them. You'll hear a lot of songs about this, you know, woman, you know, her hair was gold and it flowed down her back and the curls in her hair and 
there's a lot of stories and songs and things that have been written about the beauty of a, a woman's hair. What was the story about the, the uh, was it Rapunzel or something like this? That yeah. She had long golden hair and she let it out the window and stuff. Yeah. You know, there's something about a woman with long hair. All right? It's a glory to her. And if, it's interesting because there have been times, you don't see it so much now as you did back in the 1980s when it was more in style, but there'd be times you'd be out someplace and you'd see this thing walking along and, and long, beautiful hair, wavy hair or something. You go, man, she has pretty hair. You turn around and some guy and you're like, ah. <laughs> it's, it's not like, oh, that's normal. It's like, Bleh. you know, what in the world? You know, you see somebody with long, pretty, wavy hair. It's supposed to be a woman. But now let me make the point here. You say, well, I, I still think a woman should wear a cloth covering a veil or Christian veil, they call it. No scripture for that. You know, I still think that that's the way it's supposed to be. Do you realize by doing that, you're actually violating scripture? A woman takes the hair that God's given her for a covering and she pulls it all up and yanks it, you know, tight. I mean, you see some of these Amish women, it's like, you know, I mean, you can see their skin stretched. You know, their hair is like pulled back and then they put a cloth covering on it. Realize how ridiculous that is? It's just absurd. You're actually violating Scripture by what you're doing. There. Go ahead. It doesn't seem very natural. Verse 14, doth not even nature itself teach you. Mm -hmm. That's really unnatural. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, people come up with this stuff and it's just, it's ridiculous. All right. But you say, well, you know, I, I think that this is something that we're going to have to divide about. I think that this is a very important thing. Okay, verse 16. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Oh, you want to wear your head coverings? Go ahead. Whatever. <laughs> you want to do that? Have at it. So, the fifth and final misconception there was you can't pray wearing a hat. Bible doesn't say that. Okay, you wouldn't be able to ever wear a hat if that's the way you felt because you're supposed to be praying without ceasing. You know, there's a lot of situations where a man's at work. He has to wear, uh, you know, if you're working in construction, you have to wear a hard hat. You're not going to pray the whole time you're at work. You know, there's a lot of jobs out there where you have to wear a hat. It's just the way it is. Now, when you come to a meeting of saints and stuff like that, if you have a hat on, yeah, take your hat off. If you sit down for a meal, yeah, absolutely take your hat off before you pray. But what I'm saying is this that teaching then goes into the thing of a woman having to wear a cloth covering, which is completely anti-scriptural. And there's a lot of women in this area that I can guarantee you if they took their stupid little doily or head covering off, I bet you they'd have beautiful hair. A lot of these Mennonite girls are very pretty girls, but they got their hair yanked up and it, it looks shorter than my hair. You know? Yeah. It's not the way it's supposed to be. Now, one final misconception, which actually was brought up to me by a brother, and it's kind of like he brought it up, and I thought, you know, I never really thought much about that. And this one, I'm actually going to dedicate a whole sermon to this one. Did you ever hear the thing about pleading the blood? Is that in Scripture? No, it's not. And we're going to look about that. We're going to actually see what the motivation is for that. There's some pretty shocking stuff on that. But like I said, I'm, I was going to throw that in here at the end. And I thought, no, you know, I really need to do a whole sermon on just that one subject. Because it's very dangerous. <laughs> okay. And I was kind of half falling for it. It sounds very good. And, and, you know, there again, that's something else you have to watch out for. You have somebody that's a good Bible preacher. And if they're off... A lot of times you'll parrot what they say. It all has to go back to the Bible. You have to, you have to check everything out by the Word of God. Whatever I say, you better be listening and reading and, and looking at these verses, making sure I'm not lying to you. That's a lot of times why I'll go and I'll say something different than what the Bible says, just to kind of show you the danger there. And then, of course, you know I, I correct it. But the point is... If you're not following along with the Word of God, and if you don't know this book, you can be deceived very easily. And you can parrot things, which is what goes on with these Scripture misconceptions. 
you can say things and repeat things that aren't even in the Bible. So, that's going to be it for this study. Uh, going to be doing the pleading the blood thing. I'm not sure when I'm going to get to that. Probably in the next week or two. We'll see. But uh, that's going to be it for now. So, thank you very much for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.